Hey, this is Jason Canigan. I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about choosing lenses, legacy lenses, for a modern DSLR camera. And this is something I've got into fairly recently. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the whole process of doing that and what you can expect and that kind of thing. So why would you want to do this? Well, DSLR lenses are expensive. <laughs> they can do some pretty nice things like autofocus and that, but uh, when you compare the price of a modern lens at hundreds or even thousands of dollars versus a lens that is a legacy lens, i.e. maybe 30 years old, maybe more, you know, made in the 70s or 80s by Canon, Nikon, uh, or one of the other sort of third-party manufacturers like Tamron, uh, then th <laughs> it's, it just becomes like a very interesting option because you can get a legacy lens for $30, $15, a hundred dollars you know and so the price differential there enables you to quickly amass a range of options that you otherwise couldn't with uh, with a modern camera so the, the first question is do they work do legacy lenses work and yes of course they do they require a little more effort out of you and we'll kind of get into that but it's nothing mind-boggling or or too taxing it basically requires that you understand the tool and this is this is a problem i see with photographers uh, and and people in other fields as well musicians uh, can have this issue you know want to be musicians and people even working with power tools the equipment the gear does not make you you know it, it, so the photographer is not made by the gear that they use a good photographer who has the mind of a photographer and can visualize something before they actually take the picture of it is far more valuable than a newbie with all the greatest gear and this, this is really the problem is you have to put in some effort and some time and practice to be able to take good pictures you have to learn your equipment and also start getting a gut feel for what is required out of a situation to get a good picture you know what what uh, what length of exposure what shutter speed are we working with here right things like that what's appropriate for a resting object or an inanimate object versus some bird that's flying through the air. You're gonna require different things out of that camera. And if you have no experience with it, I don't care how good the gear is, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna be able to figure it out. And so this is unfortunately a thing that happens with a lot of people I see. They buy great gear because they think the gear is gonna make them a great photographer. And then it sits on the shelf and gathers dust. And their significant other gets mad at them usually for, for wasting resources uh, and simply not committing to the thing. You know, first you have to take crappy photos, okay? And then you have to take moderately good photos. And then you're going to take all right photos. And then after that, you're going to take pretty good photos. That's probably where I'm at right now. And then after that, you may be able to take great photos. All right? Like, I'm just at the stage where I'm thinking about maybe I ought to be lying down on my belly to take this shot because I got to get low because my subject's low, okay? That's something that newbies don't do. They take the photo of the kid from way up here, right? And they get this, like, oblique angle instead of getting down to their subject, right? It's taken me a while. You know, I started off with a Canon AE-1 back in the early 2000s, 2004, I think, was when I got mine. Uh, and it was an old camera then, but I had a buddy who was really into photography. He had turned the second bedroom of his apartment into a uh, dark room. And, that, and it was fun, you know. I got to take some after dark or a twilight long exposure pictures with that camera. And I have a lot of good memories about that. And starting to learn the terminology. And then fast forward ahead a good 10 years, you know, uh, uh, maybe more things had changed a lot digital cameras had really come into their own and now we don't even question that but remember they were kind of an oddity for a long time many professional photographers refused to change over in the early 2000s from film to digital because they couldn't get the results that they wanted out of digital cameras yet now of course it's a no-brainer right you know they get into the the uh, digital photography and they're into it you know there's no going back now so at that point, um, you know, I've probably been back in photography for about a year now. And so I bring that knowledge that I had from 10, 12 years ago to now. Uh, and I started off with collecting some 
compact commercial, uh, what you would call them, consumer cameras. There we go. Which had a big spike. And uh, and and Tony and and uh, Chelsea Northrup, who who have a wonderful channel, and uh, I bought their book. It's a great book. Tons of um, hours of, of video linked to in it. Uh, they had a, a great podcast on the death of the consumer camera, which peaked around, I think, 2012, 2013. And all the big companies invested into it. And then it just fell sharply because everybody went, well, why do we have to do this as consumers? We can just have our, uh, our iPhone cameras, our cell phone cameras, and be perfectly happy with them. And so that's good enough for them. Uh, and I started out collecting these again late. I missed the boat on these, but I had, uh, I'm looking over at the pile of them that I have now. I, I, I got six or seven of these, uh, you know, month after month, I would go out and get another one with more megapixels. Uh, and that is kind of a trap because the sensor size didn't change. It still was shooting with this pea size sensor. But it's funny because you can go back and watch my videos starting in like February of this year when I really started cranking them out for my uh, sales tactics series. And uh, the beginning, you know, they're kind of fuzzy in that. And, and that's because of the camera that I was using. It was a Kodak consumer camera and there was nothing wrong with it. I think it had 10 or 12 megapixels and it's a nice camera. It's over there. I haven't sold it or anything yet. But, uh, you know, you can actually see me progress uh, to better and better cameras. Uh, and around April, I think I got a Nikon L110, which is what's called a bridge camera. And that's what I'm shooting with now because I need my Sony mirrorless for what we're going to talk about in this video. Um, and uh, so that got me on the road to bridge cameras. I got the Canon that I'm shooting with right now. Uh, which is a great bridge camera. It's a SX30 IS, which has an amazing digital zoom on it. Just amazing. If you've seen any of the moon uh, pictures that I've taken, you'll know what I'm talking about. I've taken pictures of uh, cell towers and that where you're hundreds of feet up in the air and I'm shooting from the ground and you can read warning labels that you cannot see with the naked eye. You don't even know they're there. There, there might be this red strip of something and you're like, what is that? And, and these just put you right up there. So bridge cameras were a great transition. I have a Nikon L810 here, which I bought a few months later. And uh, you just get these things off Craigslist. Now, the thing is again, this, although it represented a, a, a substantial increase in sensor size and lens size, obviously compared to a consumer camera, this did not make me a good photographer. I went out with my L110 and shot pictures of the moon and uh, on, on the basic auto settings. And what did I get? I got a, a big white blob in the center of a black plane. Now that made me mad because right? I'm like, hey, this is supposed to be a, a good camera. I'm getting crappy shots here. Per first level of proof there, folks, that the, the gear does not make the man. You know, it does not make you a photographer just to have a camera. OK, that was better than what you were using before. So I, I gradually started to learn about the camera and how to take moon pictures really helped me out because I learned a lot about white balance and uh, an aperture and how to lessen that that light coming in so that I could get a properly exposed image of the moon. And the Canon that we're using to record this video really helped me out with that. So after a while, a few months later, somebody that's uh, got a quick release mount attached to it. Somebody was selling this Sony NEX 5M on uh, on Craigslist for 150 bucks. I mean, it was such a deal that I couldn't say no. And it's beat to hell. It, cosmetically, it's, it's not in the best shape, but it works perfectly fine. It came with the kit lens, which I've taken off because I'm going to show you something in a minute. Uh, and this is what's called a mirrorless camera. There's no mirror in here. And if we were to look at the old Canon A1, we would see that there was a, a mirror on an angle and that would flip up out of the way when the, the picture was being taken and the exposure to the film behind it. Uh, but when it was down, it would bounce the image coming in through the lens up to the eyepiece, right? And so that camera that we were just looking at doesn't have one of those things. So what I wanted to do was buy some other lenses for that Sony because it's got a much larger APS-C sensor than the the little one and two thirds inch uh, sensor inside the Canon and that uh, Nikon we were looking at a, a moment ago. So, uh, you know, I had this nice camera. It wasn't a bridge camera. It was a mirrorless camera. It enabled me to detach the lens and use something else, right? And so I thought, well, how can I do this? And I didn't want to spend thousands of dollars on 
modern Sony lenses, right, that attach to that thing. Uh, and so I thought, well, what's a cheaper way I could do this? Well, I found out about legacy lenses, which are old 30, 40 year old lenses and some in the 90s made by these manufacturers as well as third party manufacturers. And uh, and so what from what I could read about, they worked perfectly well, but I was scared to buy them because, again, I'd only had you know i bought it took me a long time i bought that uh, that camera in the late spring early summer and i didn't buy any um legacy lenses until a month ago maybe so it took five six months for me to get the courage up to do it and, and here's why and you may empathize with this you may understand what i'm talking about here when you look at the world of legacy lenses there's a ton of lenses out there it's not just the manufacturers there's all these mounts right and and you go well what is a mount and and like can i use this lens on that camera and i don't want to make a mistake now twenty dollars is not a big mistake if you're going to go buy a lens and goof up right but i would still rather have the chance of of getting the right thing so again this goes back into the willingness to pay the price to learn the gear okay to become the photographer and get the practice in that i mean if you knew I probably watched 200 hours of YouTube stuff, maybe more. I don't know. I probably watched two hours today of, of uh, photography critiques on a new channel that I just found. Because when I find a channel and a guy that I like or a lady that I like who is talking about the subject, I, I mine that ore, you know? I watch all of it. I don't just watch one video and then move on. And, and that's a huge thing that separates me from a lot of other people. Most people don't stick with a damn thing. So if I told you, you're going to have to watch 200 hours of stuff to, to really get this, to really start having a, a great idea in your mind about what's going on, that would probably send you running for the hills. And so, you know, and, and that doesn't count the blog articles or the forum posts that I've read and, and threads and the images that I've seen in there. Because what you'll do is you'll look up a lens and, and you'll get this stuff. You'll get statistics sites, you'll get reviews, you'll get forum posts with reviews sample photos taken on certain digital cameras with that lens and they'll tell you what it is and that, a lot of information that still doesn't tell you does this lens work with my camera unless it is the exact match right but what i learned was that uh i have an engineering mindset uh, my first job out of college was in the power generation field and i did a lot of equipment specifications and, and how power plants are put together and that there's pieces you have to match up and that so i applied that kind of thinking to this problem which was well what do i know you know if i had two different pieces of pipe obviously i would need to connect them together right somehow and i would need an adapter to go from this diameter to that diameter so why not the same thing here that seemed kind of obvious so I thought, okay, well, what have I got? <laughs> and it turns out that the mount on that Sony mirrorless camera is called an E-mount. And so that's what you should start with is the, the thing that you got. What is the camera you have and what is the mount if you have a detachable lens camera? That, that's what you should have if we're talking about this or are looking at. What have I got? And then look for lenses that work with that or can be adapted to work with that with an adapter ring. So I knew that I would need a something to e-mount adapter, okay? That was my starting point. And that from that that really gave me some confidence going forward there and I looked up like, well, first of all, what is this thing called? I didn't even know they were called adapter rings. You have to learn the terminology, right? Of anything that you're going to go into any field of study. And I found out yes, there are tons of X mount to e-mount adapters, whatever X happens to be. So then the next decision was, well, I don't want to get an adapter for a mount that nobody uses, where there were like six lenses made, right? I want like a hundred different kinds of lenses here for me to choose from, all at good prices. So again, here is doing the spade work. I went on eBay, I did Google searches, I looked on Amazon, and even on Etsy, I found out there are legacy lenses at good prices. Okay, I just found that out. So... You can look at all these different places and see what's there. And this name kept coming up again, Tamron, 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 Tamron. Okay, I get it. <laughs> it's, you know, it's one of the third-party serious manufacturers of, of uh, third-party lenses here. Okay, uh, legacy lenses. And there's lots of them. And they're good prices. They're like 12 bucks, 40 bucks. You know, it's not bad, okay? Especially when you're comparing it to hundreds or thousands for modern-day lenses, right? So 
then I looked, well, what mount does the Tamron have? And it turned out that they had standardized a long time ago for something called Adaptol. So now I knew I was looking for a Adaptol to Sony E-mount adapter ring. And I could Google that. And for 12 bucks, hey, I got one. This is what an adapter ring looks like, okay? And they have different uh, thicknesses for different reasons. We'll see why a little bit later. This one's fairly deep. Um, because some of the lenses have parts that stick out and so if they were flush if this was narrower It would bump up against the the sensor side of the camera and that wouldn't be very good So this keeps it at the right focal length, I guess um so this again one side is the e-mount and the other side is the adapt all so any adapt all lens now will work on my Sony NEX 5 camera and that's as simple as this. There we go. Next time I'll hold that up higher. <laughs> so this was a simple twist and turn. That's it. You know, there's little red dots that line up and you turn it. It's that simple. So how do you get the lens on? Well, then I knew I was looking for a adapt all lens and uh, I had the kit lens is eight, 18 to 55 millimeters, which is a wide angle lens. Uh, perfectly good for everyday snapshots, but I like zoom stuff. And so I found myself a tele macro lens by Tamron. It's got an adapt all mount. And uh, this sucker goes from 70 to, excuse me, 80 to 210 millimeters. And it's got the F count and uh, it's got handy little charts on the side here. So we can plug this on to that adapter mount that I have. And uh, this is what it looks like. Boy, that was hard. <laughs> so now we have a 30-year-old lens uh, and a zoom lens, macro lens, on my modern DSLR or mirrorless digital camera. Let's be accurate. So, And this thing takes great pictures. I I've been very, very happy with it. So this is the first lens that I got for the... Uh, Sony NEX5N and I'm very happy with it. It works perfectly fine. So that might be your next strategy is to kind of figure out like what am I missing? Okay, so I had the 18 to 55 and the uh, 80 to 210. What's missing in the middle, right? I don't have anything from 56 or whatever to uh, to 80, right? So I got myself a little, this is another adapt all mount and that so I knew to search for that, right? And when you search, and you come up with something like on eBay where probably the prices are going to be the best. Etsy might as well. You can take that name, that listing name, and copy it and paste it into Amazon and do a search for it. Maybe there'll be five, six, ten reviews for that. A hundred reviews for that thing, right? These have been around a long time. There's probably going to be, uh, you know, a nice, nice review. So this is a 28 to 50, 28 to 70, excuse me, millimeter lens. Uh, and so that kind of fits in the gap between what I had uh, and uh, so now all I don't have is like between 70 and 80 millimeters well who cares you know <laughs> I'm I'm perfectly happy I don't want that to roll off the table over there but uh, I'm perfectly happy with that and so that gave me the confidence we're gonna wind up pretty quick here that gave me the confidence to branch out and look at other possible uh, lens manufacturers and continuing my search in the osmosis of seeing this stuff, I saw that Canon FD mount lenses, because I now knew like, okay, well, let me look for the mount, right? Because I can get an adapter. As long as I can get an adapter to fit it onto that E-mount, I'm, I'm golden, right? So these FD lenses are the 80s, 1980s style Canon lenses, and they're all perfectly good, and they all sell for similar prices to those Tamron lenses on on eBay and that you know you can get a cheap one for 10 bucks and a great one for a hundred and somewhere in the middle is what you want yesterday I was on Craigslist because I look on Craigslist under the photo section I'm just trolling at least once a day for here in Raleigh which is about two and a half hours away right and uh, I'm looking for deals and the beautiful thing about this is I know what I need you know I know what I can use and I am patient and I don't care because I don't have the thing and I don't need the thing I've already got lenses that make me happy you know but this guy uh, a former uh, underwater professional photographer I was in his house he had some wonderful uh, blow-ups of, of the images that he'd made um, framed 
up and around his house. Uh, he was selling an old busted Canon AE-1. The, the advanced lever wouldn't work, which was something I found out was common. I could fix it, but it would mean taking apart the entire camera, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> There's a lot of little springs and stuff in there. Um, and with that, he was selling two Canon 50 millimeter lenses that were a little different from each other. One is a, a nicer version with different coatings and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, it has a slightly larger diameter lens it's over there plus a larger uh zoom lens and uh, up to 200 millimeters 80 to 200 now i already have something like that but what the hell this is you know thrown in right plus a speed light and it isn't the perfect speed light it doesn't point up you know it's a straightforward one but what the hell and all this for 25 bucks 25 bucks for all that i got three lenses and a speed light and a busted camera <laughs> for 25 bucks Okay, and I know it's going to fit because I had already ordered on eBay some uh, FD lenses that are coming to me and a mount, an FD to uh, E mount. Now, here's what to look for, and then we'll be done, okay? When you're going through these eBay listings, look for detail, all right? And you'll start to see after a while, again, through just seeing this stuff through osmosis, a sort of standardized good listing. The good listing will tell you what it is, the condition it is in and a little bit of information about it. It'll tell you like no fungus. Good. That we don't want fungus. Okay. No haze. We don't want haze. Oil on the blades or not. My first lens over there, that, that uh, zoom lens I was showing you, the guy said it had a little bit of oil on the blades. Big deal. I, I don't have enough discrimination power to notice the difference. Okay. <laughs> At this point, I, I'm perfectly happy with how that lens works, but they tell you these things. If the listing is a one liner, nice FD 200 millimeter prime lens. I'm, I'm going to close that tab. <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and so it's not enough, you know, so look for complete listings that give you a total rundown and specifically tell you like, I've looked at this thing. I've inspected it, maybe even cleaned it. Right. And there's no fungus, there's no oil, there's no slowness or anything like that. You want to look for these things and that will give you confidence. So again, pick a mount for your digital or mirrorless camera. Start with that mount, right? That's your starting point. What have you got? And then look for lenses that have a mount uh, that are in a variety and, uh, and a price range and that that you are comfortable with, that you can commit to, right? I could commit to those adapt all lenses because I saw they had low prices, good quality, and a big range of supply, right? I was, I was happy with that. Same thing with the FD mount. I can commit to that, right? And, uh, and then you know what you're getting. Get the adapter ring and uh, at least one lens to try it out so that you feel confident in getting more of these and then start to build your collection. You know, I mean, it didn't take a lot of brain power for me to make that $25 decision. You got three lenses and a speed light and a camera for 25 bucks. And it, it, I've already got the mount on its way. I'm going to go get that, right? That's a good deal. So I hope this at least gives you some confidence in looking at legacy lenses for your digital or mirrorless camera. And, uh, you know, it's really not that scary. It just, I know, and, and I hope that came across too when I explained it earlier, when you're first looking at all this stuff as a possibility, there's so many details and so much information in that. It is kind of overwhelming. And I hope that I've simplified this for you and made it so that you feel confident in going out there and selecting something and not just going, well, I wonder if this will work. I hope, <laughs> you know, you'll be able to look at it and go, okay, that's what that's saying now. When it says that it's an EF mount, I know what that is, right? And I can, I can instantly know whether I've got an adapter ring for that. And I could Google whether it, there is one to connect it up with my camera or not, and then make a solid buying decision. This is Jason Can again. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.